I'm not a grammar police, nor am I a terminology police. That's a dumb way to live. I also don't care if you make up new terminology or new words. If they're clearly defined or they mean something, I'm totally in for that. But we also have to choose our words and the terminology that we use carefully because sometimes one thing can be mistaken for a completely different thing and the original intention is lost. Hey guys, it's Siriko Matua, and today I'd like to talk about the stuff that people seem to still get mixed up when I talk about animation. Part of it is ignorance, or part of it is just mere confusion, like people just get these things confused all the time. And the things that they get confused with is so drastically different to what they originally meant. So when I'm giving feedback to a student or when I'm talking to my coworkers, there are words and terminology that gets lost in translation. And when I do talk about animation, I want to pinpoint the stuff that gets mixed up all the time when we're talking about it. First is rotoscoping versus heavy reference. Rotoscoping is the act of drawing over or on top of the footage, so this also includes practices like tracing. Using heavy reference is just the practice of utilizing significant parts of your material in reference. So an example of this is that you're heavily using a pose from a figure, from a photo, for your art. Not drawing on top of the footage, but using the motif of the image as the main basis for your reference. I noticed that people started getting this mixed up when I released my video talking about studying and copying frames from live action footage. A practice that's helped me draw the figure quickly and to get a better sense of control and motion. People came to the conclusion that I was rotoscoping. If I was rotoscoping, I would actually be drawing over the footage, whereas if you're seeing in my video recording, I just try to copy the poses in the best ability that I can just with my eye. Now, I just want to point out there's nothing wrong with rotoscoping. I think you can come up with some great material with the power of rotoscoping or drawing over the footage, but I just want to let you know that these practices are so vastly different from each other. Just as it is sad and at the same time amusing that there are some highly talented animators who use heavy reference or they don't use heavy reference and when they animate something it looks really well done. Someone keeps asking them if they rotoscoped or they accuse them of rotoscoping. Like they refuse to believe that you can animate natural looking things without drawing over a footage. Appeal versus solid drawing. These are two principles in animation and I think that this is one of the most common stuff that gets confused or mixed up all the time. Now you're gonna kind of hate me but I think appeal as a principle is a stupid principle because the word itself can lead to bias. Like I've seen people describe the Disney animation style as appealing because it just is. It's cute, it's pretty, it's hitting all the nice drawing points right. When I see animators and artists talk about appeal, they're talking about like the drawing sensibilities, the design, the principles of design aspect to it, clear gesture drawing and such. But actually all of that falls into solid drawing. In other words, this is not appeal. You know, solid drawing is known as the draftsmanship principle. So this includes the technical structural side of drawing, the construction side towards the design sensibility style. So things like straights versus curves, asymmetry, line weight, stuff like that. Even showing weight, this all falls into solid drawing, not appeal. So what the hell is appeal? And you know, appeal is said to be the, the charisma of the drawing or the animation. So this means that if it reads, it reads. If it has personality, it shows. If something is meant to be uncanny, uncomfortable, or just ugly, and it succeeds at doing that, and that's what it was meant to do, then that, by definition, is appeal. Appeal is readability and clarity, and you can't really hit all that with drawing sensibilities like asymmetry or line of action or stuff like that. It's about understanding the character. It's about understanding how that character moves or acts. A graceful character might just move very gracefully, flowy, and mundane. Whereas a very exciting, young, and frantic character might be bouncing all over the place. And then using those solid drawing skills to show that. So appeal is not just about the drawing sensibilities or the design aspect to it. It's the charm of the drawing. What? You want to make your animation smoother? Add more frames and in-betweens. There's a misconception where if you just simply add more drawings, more in-betweens and frames, it automatically means the animation is higher in production value, it's smoother, it's got that Disney animation touch. 
But if you lack any awareness of understanding your spacing and your arcs, your drawings are going to feel like they're all over the place. You're just gonna feel a bit too frantic, too noisy, too distracting. All right, but let's give benefit to the doubt. Let's say the animation is properly spaced out and the drawings are solid and it's hitting all the arcs and animation. Yes, the animation might be smoother, but at the same time, it can also feel a bit too floaty because things are just constantly moving and gliding into certain poses. Sometimes having more limited frames and just some really good drawings that are well spaced from each other is a lot more powerful than just having a shit ton of in-betweens. Sometimes if you hold on a single drawing for just a few more frames, you actually get to feel that drawing a bit more, you feel the weight of it, you feel the gesture, and you get the idea. Now, if you are going to add a shit ton of in-betweens in your animation, make sure the spacing is super tight and you understand how to utilize spacing in your in-betweens. Because although in-betweens are known to be the final touch of animation, it can also kill your animation and the effect that you initially had in your key poses. Another commonly confused one is timing and spacing. Now, timing and spacing are two very different things. Timing is more about how long or how much time is given on a certain action or a certain moment, whereas spacing is more about how far each drawings are from each other, from the previous to the next frames. Again, I've seen people mistake spacing for timing all the time, and this brings further confusion, and there's a lot of reasons to that. The first reason I can think of is because of the charts. Now, there's a lot of schools and a lot of studios that still call these timing charts. I'm actually guilty of this myself when I made my charts video. But because of this, it's kind of easy to see how people mistake the spacing notes that you get on a chart for timing. Now, I wanna show you guys something. Both of these animations have the same amount of drawings, the same amount of frames and in-betweens, but I can always change the timing for each of them. So one of them has a longer hold for the beginning. Some parts of the animation are more stylized than the other, which is more nuanced. And you can get away with so much just by playing around with the timing and how long each idea or each drawing or each frame is held for or how fast they go by. Therefore, I'm basically just changing the rhythm of each of these animations and rhythm. That's what timing is. It's got nothing to do with the spacing or the drawings themselves, but just how much time you distribute for each idea. Secondary action versus overlapping slash follow through action. Oh my God, this one is the most mixed up of the two when it comes to the world of animation. Even professional animators get this one mixed up all the time. These two are two very different things. And if I were to ask you which one resembles the flowing action of hair or cloth or a tail on a character, which one would it be? I'm pretty sure many of you will call this secondary action, but you're wrong. This is actually overlapping slash follow through action. Like I said, overlapping action is that follow through of things like hair, cloth. So when something goes down, there's another bit that still completes and continues that movement before it follows the thing it's attached to. And this doesn't always apply to things like cloth and hair. It also applies to body parts. Like let's say if a character is moving around, maybe they have their arms dragging around. With this, you can get organic animation. Now, what is secondary action? Because that's the thing that a lot of people get secondary action mixed up for follow through. Secondary action is a very different one. Basically, the way I would sum it up is that it's basically a layered attitude on top of the primary action. So in animation, we have our primary action, which is, for example, a character walking or running or jumping, some very basic thing. And then the secondary action are little details that describe how that character feels or the attitude or certain nuances that give it a bit more texture and layer to the performance. So if a character is walking, are they happy or are they angry? And how can you show that? What are some nuances you can show that to the character? Maybe we have the character just walking, but maybe we just the pose and the gesture and add a bit of additional animation, like a character just scratching their head or fist bumping the air with excitement. These little nuances is what secondary action is. And another way to view secondary action for character animation is little acting details on top of your animation. The next one is squash and stretch versus weight. One of the most laziest feedback that I keep seeing in online animation discords and communities is that when someone gives the feedback of adding more weight to an animation, they just say, just add more squash and stretch because that's what weight is. But that's not entirely true because you can show good weight with just timing, how the arcs are portrayed, the overlapping action, the spacing, the slow ins and outs, and the overall drawing. 
And maybe someday I'll do a video talking about how we can use the 12 principles to show weight. One of the most important things for having believable animation. And every time someone rants about the nine old men style of animation or the Disney animation style in favor for anime, they blame it on the obsession of that style's use of squash versus stretch. It's too cartoony, it's too zany, it's too old fashioned. But the truth is squash and stretch is used for things like body parts, like the head. So if a character opens their mouth, the part where their jaw meets is where the squash and stretch happens to make that animation a lot more elastic. Even just the mere concept of a character being compressed and a character stretching wide open. These create contrasts and can make the animation feel a lot more dynamic and interesting to see. The squash and stretch is more of a tool or just a concept. It doesn't always have to represent weight, nor is it the only factor for Western classical animation. Look, just watch some of your favorite anime and maybe you won't be seeing bouncing balls or squash and stretch, but you'll feel the weight. And why is that? That's something that you kind of have to sort of observe and study and get educated on. So there you have it, that was my TED talk on some of the most mixed up animation terminology that I see people mix up all the time. And every time I see this in animation chats or animation communities where people call the use of heavy reference as rotoscope, it's baffling. And that's when the truth of the matter gets distorted and that's where it becomes problematic. But hey, people get things mixed up all the time. The only problem I see from it is the misinformation that it can spread. Anyways, that's all, bye bye Interested in learning hand-drawn animation or learning how to finish an animated shot from beginning to end? Have a look at the store where you'll find the complete introduction to 2D animation video course, tutorials, and other resources. Learn classical animation approaches, drawing, lectures, techniques, and other process videos. Visit the store through the link in the description below.